I, I happen to think that um, for us to be successful in the roles that we have, whatever your role is within the organization, um, it's really important to kind of know where we've come from. Um, I'm not a history major. I'm not a history person. I studied political science in my undergrad and studied, um, I was a grad, or I'm a graduate of the College Student Services Administration program, same as Erica. So um, history is not really my thing. Uh, but I do enjoy knowing a bit about the history of the organization that I help advise what we call today the ASOSU. So um, I started in my role in uh, November of 2012, that first winter break, just about two weeks after I started. Um, I spent the better part of two weeks during winter break in the uh, Valley Library Special Collections and Archives where I did just a ton of research to understand the organization. What have we done? Where have we come from? Why do we exist? So from that, I put together a presentation. Um, I've tried to keep it distilled to what I think is really kind of the important points. Um, and some of them are more important than others. Some of them have more meaning than others. But um, if I start to see you glaze over, I'll try and move on quickly. So. Um, 1890s to 1900s. We have a very long history within ASOSU. So, 1898, um, the, the Oregon Agricultural College, as it was called at the time, um, their football team was in debt to a laundry proprietor here in uh, at the time Marysville um, and then Corvallis. And, um, or excuse me, it was Corvallis College at the time. Um, so, the Corvallis College football team was in debt to this laundry proprietor. Um, the university said, you know what, we're going to close the football team. We can't continue to pay. Um, our team then, much like now, was not very good. And so they weren't bringing in crowds and therefore bringing in money. Um, and so they weren't able to pay to get their uniforms laundered because at the time we didn't have AstroTurf. They played on a hog field. So not only muddy, but also smelly. Um, at the time, in 1899, just before the football season, the Corvallis College students voted to impose an optional student fee of 25 cents per student per semester um, in order to save the football team. So this was sort of the first student-led action on our campus, and it was to save the football team, but it was also the first student fee, which is a big part of our roles within the legislative branch as we continue on um, with today's lessons. So this student fee in 1899 was the first action that really kind of created this group of students who said, we want to represent ourselves. And so in 1900, the first student body organization was unanimously voted into being uh, with faculty approval. The organization was called Student Assembly, and the enrollment of the college at the time was 405 students. So just some perspective from where we are today. Um, so that happened in 1900. 1901 was our foundation year. So our birthday is 1901. The first constitution wasn't adopted for another five years, and then the student fees were made mandatory in 1909, so they were no longer optional. Um, this was a big step, and uh, we were one of the first schools across the country uh, to make mandatory student activity fees. So um, that same 1909 year, the um, football team that we helped save became uh, champions of their division, beating out... Uh, it was a Loyola College, I think, from California, if I remember correctly. So that was from the barometer that day, or that year, excuse me. So 1910, the student body then at the time supervised the barometer, the oratory and debate clubs, the athletics and student council. Um, this is an interesting division of different parts of, kind of campus life that they governed at the time. Um, very representative to sort of how our current day student fees are broken apart as well. Oratory and debate clubs, so speech and debate, um, are our performing arts. The barometer represents our student media. Um, athletics is still athletics, and student council now we would call ASOSU. Um, we've grown as well. So, 1911, the faculty turned over the powers of government to the students. Basically saying the faculty in 1911 finally recognized that the students had the autonomy to speak for themselves. They didn't have to ask permission to speak on their own behalf. They, are, they were allowed to sort of represent themselves. So in 1917, then, we um, had the second official constitution created. This is an official copy 
of that constitution. It's on display in, or not display, but it is in the um, special collections and archives, which is kind of cool. You can go there and actually thumb through it and read it. 1920s. So our third official constitution um, was passed in 1923. As we kind of progress, you'll start seeing that there's sort of a regular attempt somewhere around every eight to 12 years to rewrite our constitution. So we're looking at every sort of two to three cyclical groups of students, assuming a four year progression, that we're changing over our constitution. Ironically, if you haven't voted, vote today. Um, we are looking at eight years following the last time we updated our constitution to update it again right now. So uh, the student council's duties included the formulating and enforcing regulations and discipline as directed by the student body. What does that mean? What do you think that means? To actually receive the feedback from the students and attempt to implement it? Yep, that's good. So they took feedback from students and said, you know, students don't like this part of campus life, so we're going to help change it. Yes, they did that. What else might that mean? So they formulated and enforced regulations and discipline. What does that sound like in modern day campus language? They created rules and punishments. They created rules and punishments. They created the student honor code, or what today we would call the student code of conduct. They also enforced discipline if you broke the student code of conduct. Um, in 1923, all the men across campus had to wear all the first and second year, so what we call modern day freshmen and sophomores, all the men had to wear green berets anytime they were physically on campus, and all the women had to wear green ribbon in their hair. You were called a greenie, you were a fresh student. Um, if you were a greenie and you were caught without your green on, um, our colors at the time were not orange and black, at the time they were blue and silver, so green was sort of a neutral color. Um, but if you were caught on campus as a greenie without your greens on, then you could be um, punished. And punishment could be uh, sort of a corporal type punishment, get down and do push-ups, uh, run back to your house and put your greens on and come back. Um, you might be told to um, you know, go to the women's building or go to Langton Hall and swim laps, whatever your punishment might be. Um, they did enforce punishment in that. So, some interesting parts. What we know is our modern day quad wasn't quite done in 1923, but in 1929, when this building opened, the quad was there. As a greenie, you couldn't walk through the center of the quad. You had to walk around the perimeter. Um, at the end of your sophomore year, greenies had a ceremonial burning of the green where there was a big bonfire. Um, this is no joke. And the what would be the junior students at the time who would then sort of ceremonially become the senior students would help the sophomore students across Dixon Creek, <coughs> Oak Creek. Um, I'm not sure exactly where on campus, but there was a crossing of the creek, therefore sort of crossing ceremoniously over to upper class status. Um, so some of our traditions that we have lost, some for good reason, others I think just because. <laughs> So, in 1923, the first official use of the term associated students came to be. Um, this is important because it really called out us being, instead of an assembly, now we have an official association. We have some purpose. Um, and in 28, the student council clarifies the smoking ban and boundaries. I just thought this was interesting because not more than six years ago on our campus, we had a big campus-wide discussion of whether we should even ban smoking here at Oregon State. Um, I actually, I guess it's now about 10 years ago, but the smoking ban from 1928 mirrored the smoking ban that got implemented 10 years ago. So I thought that was kind of interesting. 30s to 40s, so in 1936, uh, the Educational Activities Board is established. This was um, a student, a portion of the student activity fees that paid for like the speech and debate clubs and um, it would be akin to our modern day source or what does SOURCE stand for? Student? Uh, <laughs> student Organization Resource. Sorry. Resource for Community Engagement or something? Uh, yeah. Okay. So SOURCE is put the source of funds for student clubs and organizations on campus to get funding for events and things that they might want to bring. 
the, at the time we called it educational activities. The mission still is the same today as it was in 36. So in 1941, the Associated Students of Oregon State College, we're now Oregon State College, not Corvallis College, um, they issued a resolution against the Japanese internments within Oregon and the United States. I find this important for a couple of reasons. Number one, it demonstrates that this body, what you all represent today, um, can be political. You all can raise a political voice. You can enter into the political fray. The president of ASOSU, uh, myself as a university employee, those of us who receive pay from the university can't enter into the political conversation. We have to remain apolitical. Um, that may be an interesting topic when we're thinking about student government. Um, but in this case, the student senate passed this resolution. So that's the first reason. They wanted to get political. That's why I thought this was most interesting. The second part is 1941, we played in, or 1942, excuse me, um, shortly after this, Oregon State was national championship football team. Um, one of the few decades where we were actually good. And um, we made it to the Rose Bowl. Well, in 1942, um, this was January of 42. In December of 41, the Japanese had just bombed Pearl Harbor. And so in 42, um, out of scare for potential invasion of a large mass of people on the West Coast in Southern California, they moved the Rose Bowl from Pasadena, California, over to Raleigh, North Carolina. Our competitor was Duke, so Duke was the home team. We played on Duke's field. That meant that our star running back, Jack Yoshihara, was unable to travel across the country to play with his football team that he had been playing with all year long. He brought them to the national championship. And now that the team was traveling to the other side of the country, he was barred from traveling. Our student government got involved and said, this is unfair. So, 1944, the first woman president of the association uh, was not elected. Um, at this time, we had a president, a first vice president, and a second vice president. Um, shortly after coming into office, after the fall semester, um, the male president who was elected, um, he had to leave the institution because he failed out of school. So the first vice president, who at the time happened to be a woman, was um, inaugurated into the role and sworn in and became the first woman president. Anybody want to guess how long it would be before the second female person would hold that post? What's that? Exactly 20 years. 1964 would be the next time a woman would hold that position. So I find that very interesting. Um, and also good for us to recognize that women have played a role from very early on in our um, association. Uh, throughout World War II, the ASOSC directs student efforts in the war support, so bandage kits, local farming, food, gas rationing. This is a poster for Victory Gardens, which we had lots of Victory Gardens across campus. Victory Garden was essentially um, asking people to grow their own fruits and vegetables in small quantities so that the large scale farm operations, their food could be transferred to the war front to feed the men and women who were on the war front. So I just found that interesting. And I also was trying to add some color commentary to the presentation. Um, in 45, we hosted, co-hosted with the ASUO, um, Victory Day Celebration in Pioneer Square in Portland, where we raised a million dollars in war bonds. We, as an ASOSC, raised a million dollars in war bonds. The Ducks raised 400000 <laughs> No joke. Uh, so yes, our rivalry with U of O is long um, and, and runs deep. But this is not a picture of the Victory uh, Day celebration that we were at, but this is a picture of a Victory Day celebration. Um, as you can see, this building kind of here in the center, the white one says Victory Center. It was built, Victory Centers across the country like that were built um, to celebrate the end of the war. Um, this was supposed to be the war to end all wars. So we had a big Victory Day celebration across most every major city in the country. Um, and people were selling these war bonds to try and pay back the war effort so that we would not be in debt as a country. So uh, we established the Student Senate in 1948. So this was the first time where the student voice 
the voice of the student body transferred out of the hands of the elected president, vice presidents, into a representative body called our student senate. Um, we would maintain a student senate all the way until 2009, when we would divide into a bicameral system with a senate and a house. All that time prior, we just had a senate. Um, there was some periods of time where we had a graduate student senate and an undergraduate student senate, but still they comprised one body. All right, 1959, um, student resolution in the Senate to rename Oregon State College to Oregon State University. Um, our friends to the South had been recognized from very early on as a university. Um, at the time, university status required, as it does today, um, advanced degrees, including doctoral degrees. We had long since been offering doctoral degrees and had several doctoral programs and yet we weren't recognized by the state and our accreditation partners as a university. So our students said, this isn't fair. You know, when we get called a college, we don't bring in the prestige, we don't bring in the students from across the state that the University of Oregon does, we should have a, a similar title. So they fought for that and passed a resolution through the Student Senate, it went through the Faculty Senate, um, the university president at the time, then pushed it to Governor Hatfield and to the Oregon legislature and said, please rename us. Um, and then I'll skip in 61, a couple years later, Governor Hatfield signed a bill changing the name to Oregon State University. Um, so that was a student led effort from the beginning, which is pretty cool. Uh, in 59, we provided funds as, excuse me, oh, my voice cracked like I'm young again. Uh, <laughs> uh, we provided funds for the Carolinic Bell system for the NU. Uh, at 4.55 and 5 o'clock, how many of you have heard the bells that chime from the top of this building? Plays the alma mater and then the fight song. Um, if you haven't, and then on May 4th, they also play, I think, the Star Wars um, <laughs> Imperial March. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we, we actually, ASOSC, uh, or at this, just before that, yeah, ASOSC donated the funds to the Memorial Union as a thank you for being sort of our meeting place and our living room and the livelihood of campus. We donated the funds to buy that system. Um, the bells have long since gone away. It's now a computer recording played on a loudspeaker, um, but it's still the same sort of bell chiming sound. 62, um, so just last night, or yesterday, I should say, I was doing some updates to this presentation and I started looking into a little bit more history and found out that the um, first international student and first student of color elected to the position of president was 1962. George Abed was elected um, and he would later go on to serve as, I think, president of the International Monetary Fund um, and how, hold several positions within the United Nations um, representing the Middle East, but he was the ASOSU president in 62. 63, um, ASOSU and ASUO presidents lobbied to successfully put a student voice on the State Board of Higher Education. We'll get into structures here a little bit later, but um, we were a university of the state. All decisions that have statewide impact are made through the legislature. Um, there's a body between the legislature and the universities at the time called the State Board of Higher Education. This was before we had our own boards of trustees. That had no student voice on it. It was a bunch of predominantly old white men making decisions about the universities across the state and didn't have any real touch with the student voice. So the students of the two major universities in the state lobbied and got a student placed on that committee. Not as a a stand-in student, but as a full voting uh, representative, which was great. In 64, we successfully lobbied to provide a discount to students and student ownership of the OSU bookstore after an internal pay scandal. Um, regardless of what you may think of our student media and our barometer today, um, they do great things. And in 64, they did a really great thing by uncovering a pay scandal um, inside the leadership of the OSU bookstore. At the time, it was owned by the university. The bookstore manager um, was taking funds and, and secretly paying their employees additional money um, instead of returning that money sort of back to the students by way of lowering costs of textbooks and things like that. 
And so in 64, when the barometer uncovered this and did a big investigative report in one of their um, editions, the students of ASOSU then said, you know what, this needs to be um, a co-op where we have joint stake ownership in that um, endeavor. And so as a result, you all get discounts that I don't get because you're students um, on your textbooks. So things like that are great. 60s continued. So in 65, uh, we lobbied the Oregon State Legislature for a state bond measure, uh, which then passed um, all of the citizens of Oregon, which provided a $100 discount per year on tuition just to OSU. So the, city, the citizens of Oregon passed this bond measure, and it provided a discount if you went to OSU over any of the other institutions across the state. 68, a student bill of rights was created. Students were given autonomy for their own government from the university administration. My voice is cracking again. Um, this is interesting because we would have this student bill of rights for a number of years, and then after time it would sort of get lost. And it would be um, quite some time before we would have another student bill of rights as we moved into the future. So in 69, protests became a normal happening on campus, both ours as well as many others. What would we have been protesting in the, the late 60s, early 70s? Vietnam. Vietnam War. <coughs> Civil rights. rights. What's that? Women's rights. Women's rights. Gay rights. Gay rights. Yep. All, all of these things. Um, I know I put some things up here to cheat, but uh, <laughs> yes. These aren't pictures from Oregon State. These are just sort of demonstration or campus demonstration pictures that I found uh, to provide context. But yes, in the late 60s, early 70s, protests across college campuses, including our own, became a regular occurrence. Um, it would be almost daily that if you tried to walk through the quad, there would be somebody uh, protesting something, or usually large groups of people protesting, often fighting for space for different causes. So. <laughs> Um, in the 70s, I'm going to rush through this, uh, but in the 70s, a student position was added for the ASOSU president on the faculty senate. That position still exists to this day. Um, also in 70, we led an effort to fund and build Dixon Rec Center through student fees. Uh, prior to 72, when Dixon Rec Center opened, uh, we had two locations on campus, well, kind of three locations actually on campus where students were given the space, both indoors as well as out, to exercise, what would those two places or three places have been? The women's building. Alexander. McAlexander for ROTC. Lincoln for the men. So up until 72 when Dixon Rec Center opened, we still had segregated by gender um, uh, workout facilities unless you were, uh, well, well, if women were allowed in ROTC in the early 70s? It's <coughs> a good question. So, um, but yes, in 72, when it finally opened, um, ASOSU had led that effort, kind of a student-wide effort to get this new rec center um, funded and created. Um, in 71, we created a legal advising office and we hired counsel independent of the university. This is important because this is when our student legal advising and our office of advocacy as one unit uh, were founded was in 1971. We approved the funds in 72 for the creation of the child care facility. Um, doing research into this, we had been assessing student needs on campus for about 12 years. Every single year for 12 years, child care needs for student parents continued to be one of the top five issues raised. It took 12 years before ASOSU got the um, political capital and work with the university to really bring that to life. So in 73, we created the funds to create the Women's Studies Department. Yes, Women's Studies, what we now call today the Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies, as well as the Women's Center. At the time, the Women's Studies Department was both a drop-in center uh, for women on campus, as well as an academic center. And then they would later split, one for programming, one for education, um, and now we know them as gender, Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies, um, and then also the Women's Center. So in 73, we again got involved in national politics with the resolution to impeach President Nixon. So I'm going to try and stay apolitical. 
74. Um, this is a time period where we really got involved in what was offered to students, particularly um, traditionally marginalized or underrepresented and minority students on our campus uh, through the 70s. In 74, we issued $1,000 to create the Corvallis bus system for OSU students. At the time, the city was looking to start a bus system, um, and we said, you know what, students should have access to that without needing to pay when they get on the bus. Because <coughs> they're already nickel and dimes to death, as you all are still today. Um, so we issued $1,000 to the city and said, here's $1,000, let students run on this bus every day for free. Um, and we've continued that relationship since. In 75, um, we helped establish the Black Cultural Center with just shy of a $2,000 donation. These donations paid for a half-time secretary um, to sit in an office at a desk with a telephone, a typewriter, paper, pencils, and that's it. Um, so this wasn't necessarily uh, programming dollars. This was just to have somebody sit in an office that was labeled the Black Cultural Center. Um, that would change as we continue the next slide, we'll see that. But 76, the Chicano <coughs> Cultural Center was established. 77, we didn't establish a cultural center per se for gay people. Um, pardon me and the, the term, terminologies here, these are theirs. Um, there's another one here a little bit later um, that's not a term we would use today, but the Gay People's Alliance was established with $1,000 and it wouldn't be until 2004 or 2005, then an actual resource center for LGBT students on our campus would be established. Um, in 78, we, along with many other student governments, lobbied for the tuition tax credit in the IRS code. Uh, we passed a resolution to oppose the peacetime draft. So in 79, um, the Korean War, that sort of, well, World War II, one and two, that opened the draft sort of after each war would successfully end, they would close the draft. Well, after Vietnam War, they never closed the draft. They kept it open, meaning that at any moment, they could return to the draft, and any man under the age of 25 could be drafted like that into the military, even though we weren't actively in conflict across the world. So we had a peacetime draft still open. So in 79, students from across the country said, that's yes. We should not have this sort of looming over our heads while we're trying to get an education. Um, so let's close that. And they did. In 79, we passed a resolution to denounce an increase from 25% cost of attendance on the shoulders of students, residential students, to 30%, and an increase from 60% to the cost of attendance on the shoulders of um, non-Oregonian and international students, non-residents. Um, to 70%. I found those interesting because those numbers, just in terms of like 30% is what you would have paid for your cost of attendance then, and the state picked up 70%. Now, you pick up over 75%, and the state pays just less than 25%. So those numbers have entirely flopped. And residents still, non-residents still kind of get really um, hosed when it comes to how much they pay to come here. But how many of you are non-residents? All right, yeah. Um, during the 1980s, we lobbied successfully to retain the quarter system. Um, the quarter system worked very well in Oregon based on the agrarian or the farming calendars to really provide, um, because our harvest season went later into the um, fall. So for us to start in late September made more sense. Um, faculty and state administrators wanted that system to match the um, semester system, which starts earlier in mid-August and ends in early May. Um, and they said, you know what, this doesn't make sense. We come from predominantly farming communities across from Oregon. We have harvests <coughs> that go all the way up until even October. We can't be taking a lot of our labor and sending them off to school. So uh, we proposed in 81 a major expansion of Dixon Rec Center through student fees. So 10 years after it was built, it had already outgrown, or we had already outgrown the use of what was at the time Dixon Rec Center. We needed it to be bigger. Um, it's interesting. It's grown since then two more times, and we're still now way undersized for the size of our student population. 
Um, in 87, we would fund the BCC Programming Board, a black cultural center. So now, rather than just having a, a space with an office and a half-time secretary with a phone and a typewriter, um, we now had funds provided to the Black Cultural Center to do programming across campus. This would start a progression of providing similar funding to cultural centers across campus. Um, I'm glad that I made this edit. I forgot that I did. Um, in 1988, we founded what is now called the ASOSU Safe Ride. It had another name prior to that um, where it was focused predominantly on female students across campus. And um, if you're interested in the name, I'll tell you privately. But um, the Safe Ride program is one of our sort of hallmark programs of our services today. The 1990, oh, I forgot to change the title of this one. So this is the 1990s, it's not the present. Um, there's, I added more after this. Uh, we brought on in-house counsel for ASOSU Legal Advising from the local community. So now in, uh, at this point, we said, you know what? Um, we need to have our own lawyers. Instead of hiring outside counsel, uh, we need to have our own lawyers that are employed by ASOSU. Um, and we brought them in, and they helped represent students um, to both on-campus um, potential legal issues as well as off, all together in one office. Uh, we fought back state legislature for several tuition buybacks and decreases. Uh, we advocated, oh, I forgot to delete those. I'm just gonna skip to the next. All right, so the 2000s, we started getting really busy when it came to about 2000. Uh, the Office of Advocacy was created. Uh, Vivian works for the Office of Advocacy right now, and um, are you going to next year? Yes. She will continue next year. So our Office of Advocacy, so now in 2000, we've split sort of our legal services to students. Now we have an office dedicated to on-campus issues and an office dedicated to off-campus issues. Um, so that way we would be able to have better service to students. The people who represented issues on campus were no longer the lawyers. Uh, they were people with legal training, but not lawyer practicing lawyers. Um, in 2000, the Women's Affairs Task Force would lead efforts to open safe ride service to men. So it started in 88. For 12 years, men weren't allowed to ride, work, participate in safe ride. It wouldn't be until 2000 that men could ride. Um, in 2004, we had a student-led, contentious campus-wide effort to fund the Queer Resource Center. Um, this took over a year to come to a resolution. Um, if you've ever been to a student fee committee meeting, uh, our open hearing, we might have 50 people there maximum. Um, we have video of this particular one where 400 plus students and community members came to either speak on behalf of or against the opening of a queer resource center. It was very contentious. Um, in 2004 also, we agreed to fund two and a half million dollars towards raising RESER construction projects, so the new side of RESER Stadium. Um, at the time, it was called um, Parker Stadium. So we wanted to create raising, or the, you know, raise research out of the ground. Um, and student fees would fund two and a half million dollars of it, guaranteeing students 6,082 seats in a new section of Research Stadium. Um, also in 04, the Student Parent Advocate Program was created. This is a precursor to the Family Resource Center. So this is a student level position within the executive branch who was focusing just on student parent needs. Um, and then we would also establish a shared governance agreement with President Ray, really setting ASOSU into a level of autonomy that they hadn't had before. In 05, so we gave two and a half million dollars to Raising Research. Well, after they fully funded the project and got money from the state as well as donors, they said, wait, we have more money than we need. So rather than building even bigger, they said, let's give students back some of the money that they gave us. But now we've already voted to give money towards capital construction. So now student groups, including ASOSU, could go to the student fee committee and say, we have ideas for additional capital construction on campus. Let's apply for some of those funds. ASOSU applied for a half million dollar grant from the Raising Research Funds um, to build the Human Services Resource Center, which at the time, literally was a four-page document. That's all that in 2005 the HSRC was. Um, also, we had an initiative to build what would become the SEC. So it started in 2005. 
we wouldn't open until 2015. So it was a 10 year long thought that would exist. In 06, we re-secured the prime student seating in athletic venues. So um, the baseball team in 2006 won the national championship. Um, we would win it again the next year, but after the baseball season um, looked, or through that 2006 baseball season, as athletics was saying, wow, our team's really good, and we gave all the prime seating to students. Well, we have a really great team. We can sell these prime seats for a lot more than students are giving us. So mid-season, they moved the student seating to the outfield and sold all the student seats to the general public. So ASOSU led a revolt. And they blocked students from, um, per well, not purchasing, but blocked students from going to the baseball games. And they picketed and actually decreased attendance at some of the baseball games. And the athletics department came back and said, whoa, we think we screwed up. So let's work on this. So we came into an agreement on where prime seating was for students and how many that would be. Um, in 06 to 07, we would offer what we called the Escape Hunger Program. So this was a free lunch to all students, Tuesday through Thursday. It was in the um, Snell, the old Snell kitchen, which was a dining center long, long ago. Um, we would offer this free lunch. It was done by volunteers with, you know, maybe one or two paid staff members from ASOSU. Um, in 07, the Meal Bucks Program would be created after the Escape Hunger begins to lose its volunteer base. Um, Meal Bucks is still probably one of the most successful student fee-funded programs um, that students really see as valuable to them and their peers. Um, and it played out into this year's student fee allocation process as well, where our Congress voted to not approve the HSRC budget because it was underfunded. So they added more money to the HSRC budget to pay for more Meal Bucks money to go out to students as well as to hire additional staff for the HSRC which in 2008 officially opened its doors um, and it started in some storage closets of Snow Hall. So um, literally a, a, their total amount of space was about half the size of the other room next door. Now they have almost a full building with multiple levels with a full kitchen. Um, they've got showers and lockers and laundry facilities um, all for students. Erica works there today. Textbook lending program. Textbook lending program, yeah. The food pantry, um, yeah. So lots to do in the HSRC for students. Um, again, one of those things that came up out of ASOSU. Um, in 2008, we would approve the campus-wide vote, um, or we would approve, yeah, a new constitution through a campus-wide vote, and that constitution would take effect in 2009, where our first House of Representatives and Speaker of the House were elected and took office. Um, in 2013, ASOSU with the OSA would lobby the legislature to establish independent boards. So rather than having this state board of higher education over all public universities in the state, now we have our own independent board. We are, an, at the time we were hoping to become an independent state agency, which is exactly how it turned out. Um, but not just independent boards, we said students have to have a seat on that committee or on that board. Students have to have a voice, and it can't just be somebody who goes to the meeting. They need to have a full vote, and we got it. And we also said, and the independent board can't have total control over student fees. The students need to have some control over student fees. We got it. Um, in 14, we would lead in an effort to establish a veterans lounge in the Memorial Union. In 16, we would lobby the library for 24 5 24 hours a day for five days a week operations. They've since cut that back. And I know students are already talking about that. Um, in 2016, we would renew the shared governance agreement and create a new student bill of rights, um, in part led by Josh, who's here. So that brings us to modern day. Um, we've done a lot. And again, I'm sorry that that was a lot. To glaze over. Hopefully you didn't have to take all the notes. Um, we will certainly share these with anybody who wants them. Um, I think it's important because as you'll, as we saw, a lot of the things that ASOSU has done came out of this group, came out of the House and Senate. Um, and 
we can accomplish a lot when we come together. We have a ton of resources at our fingertips. So it comes down to how we want to use them and what we want to get done across campus for our peers. Um, there isn't a thing on there that we didn't have a role in doing. So whether you want to create the next HSRC or you want to create a new advising office on campus or you want to create a new resource center or cultural center, whatever the case may be, um, or you have a new service not even offered to students today that you want to see happen on <coughs> campus, we can do that. It's a matter of using the resources we have, leveraging the commitment of faculty and staff across campus to support you to do that, and then taking the action. So that's my inspirational speech. <laughs> <laughs>